Hello and welcome to week two. At the end of week one we were working on the Belmont Report. So I had you read the Belmont Report. We did an exercise on the Belmont Report. Um, and I had one video that I showed that put the Belmont Report in the historical context of um, the development of bioethics in the 20th century and the rise of the importance of informed consent as a principle of uh, basic ethics in medicine. Uh, just now you should have watched, right before this, you should have watched an interview with Tom Beecham, uh, the author of the Belmont Report. And now I want to actually get down to the content of it, right? So the, the last two videos you watched were essentially about the context for the Belmont Report. And um, now I want to talk about content. The Belmont Report um, articulates three basic principles in bioethics. Respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And so this becomes the ethical framework that a lot of bioethics is still done in to this day. People tinker around with parts of it, but this is a primary way that people think about ethics in medicine. So um, in the interview, you saw Beecham said that he came in um, a little bit of the way into the process and the people he was working with, the, they were all doctors and medical professionals, had come up with these principles, but they didn't know what they meant. And so it was Beecham's job as a philosopher to figure out what these words mean. Um, interestingly, he says quite explicitly that he thought of himself as articulating universal ethical principles. So if anyone wanted to do experiments in medicine, um, they would need to follow these principles, otherwise they would be behaving unethically. What was actually surprising to them, though, was that uh, it wound up being taken up globally. So they didn't think that this would be that big a deal. In fact, he thought that he'd gotten a bum assignment in being told to write this part of the Belmont Report. But in fact, this has become incredibly important for the practice of uh, medical ethics worldwide. And this was an extension of the um, civil rights movement. Uh, a lot of times it just sort of gets reduced to this was a response to, to the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiment revelations, but it really was an extension of the whole movement, and that was a part of the times that um, he uh, thought, that they thought they were articulating. All right. One important thing to see about these three principles is that none of them are intended to be what he calls trumping. That is to say, none of them take priority over the other. Another phrase he uses there is that the, these are prima facie principles. Uh, prima facie just means first face, at first look. So if you're considering an ethical situation, these are the first things you should look at. They're not necessarily the only things you should look at or the last things you should look at, but these are the first things you should look at. And although these principles have been taken up everywhere, um, a lot of the times the, you, uh, 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 the obedience to them has been basically nominal. Um, people are just getting uh, the, uh, a piece of paper that creates the illusion of informed consent and not really going for the reality. Although Beecham does emphasize that uh, existing practice is, there's a huge spectrum here and some people are doing this quite well. All right, so what I want to do now is look at each of these principles individually, relate them to other things we've read, and talk about applying them to what we've read so far in the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. All right, so the first basic principle that they came up with was respect for persons. And this is how Beecham articulates it. Respect for persons incorporates at least two ethical convictions. First, that individuals should be treated as autonomous agents. 
And second, if pers persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. And right away, actually, in the interview, Beecham is like, maybe these should have been two separate principles, but we'll just leave it as it is now. We want to, I want to focus, though, on what, uh, on this word autonomy. I've, we've mentioned it before, so I want to review and repeat important points about autonomy. So autonomy is your right to control your own life. Um, that is a normative statement that is describing what ought to exist. You ought to have control of your own life. In order to have control of your own life, you need to have actions that are free from external constraints. No one is holding a gun to your head. No one has locked you in a room. No one has tied you to a chair. But they also need to be free of internal constraints. And this is where the idea of someone with diminished autonomy comes in. Um, simply acting randomly is not acting autonomously. You act autonomously if you are able to decide on a goal and then follow through to that goal. You say to yourself, I want to graduate community college and I want to be, um, you know, uh, a dental hygienist. You set a goal and you follow through on it. That's autonomy. That, and that's different than simply behaving randomly. When you behave randomly, you are under internal constraints, essentially. So if you're addicted, is the easiest example. If you are addicted and that prevents you from achieving your goals, that is an internal constraint. So sometimes we talk about people with diminished capacity for autonomy or, some, or diminished competence. So what we can say is autonomy is your right to control your own life. And then competence is your ability to control your own life uh, w without internal constraints. So one notion is normative and one is descriptive. In medical ethics, the idea of autonomy often comes down to the idea of informed consent. So informed consent is a voluntary communicative act made by a competent, knowledgeable adult that allows someone else to do something that they wouldn't otherwise morally be able to do. I want to emphasize two points about this. I did this before, I'm doing it again because it's important. Consent is a, is a form of communication, right? It's not just an internal mental state of liking or disliking something. You have to voluntarily, voluntarily and sincerely say you want to do something, and that will transform an immoral action into a moral one. Um, and that is, uh, that's incredibly important and incredibly powerful. So um, a, a sex act is typically more, can be moral with consent and immoral without consent. That's a pretty magical property. Um, and so in order to understand consent, we have to understand how it can do these things. All right. Beneficence. In general, what he says is, let's so I want to talk a little bit about respect for persons applying this Belmont principle to the situation that Henrietta Lacks was in. Um, and so the, one of the most obvious things that went wrong in the story of Henrietta Lacks was a failure of informed consent. They did not tell her she would be infertile after the process, and they did not tell her they were taking her tissue. So um, those are two basic failures of informed consent. The, that's the most obvious ethical problem here. I think as we dig deeper, what we'll find is that there were other problems. All right. So the second principle of the Belmont Report is beneficence. And the Belmont Report defines it this way. Two general rules have been formulated as complementary expressions of beneficent actions in this sense. Do not harm and maximize possible 
benefits and minimize possible harms. So these are common ways that we talk about beneficence, um, that is doing good in the world. And you notice actually there's, they're kind of intention. There's a bit of contradiction here. Do no harm is a phrase people love to kick around in medical ethics because it is uh, a standard translation from something from the Hippocratic Oath. Doctors are supposed to do no harm. Uh, in practice, that's not how anything ever works because all of medicine involves trade-offs. So if you are, for instance, amputating a infected limb, you are doing some harm for a greater good. So often, the, in practice, the principle of do no harm takes its second form, uh, maximize benefits and minimize harms. So this is an approach to ethics that is often associated with the uh, utilitarian philosophy, school of philosophy and a philosopher named John Stuart Mill. But um, here it's just playing the role of one principle among three that are important. So interestingly, benefic beneficence may have been completely honored in the case of Henrietta Lacks. Um, that is, the actual uh, direct harms and benefits um, balance uh, the actual benefits have outweighed the harms. The HeLa cell line has saved millions of lives. And there was actually nothing that could have been done to save lax. So this sounds harsh, but that also lets us know that there's got to be more to ethics than simply doing minimizing harm and maximizing benefit because clearly something went wrong here. There was a failure of consent. Nevertheless, harms were minimized and benefits were maximized. So the last principle um, I want to talk about is justice. This is how the Bumelt Report defines justice. Who ought to receive the benefits of research and bear its burdens? The question of justice is in, this, in the sense of fairness of distribution or what is deserved. And Beecham and the Belmont Report actually wound up placing very little emphasis on justice as a concern. But I think what's, going for, what's coming out now in a lot of medical ethics and um, so, social movements in general is that justice cannot be thought of as a trailing third concern. So I want to go into a fair amount of detail about justice here. So there's a simple sense in which justice is fairness or moral consistency. Justice means treating similar cases similarly. Um, I believe I have uh, mentioned that formulation before and I'm going to mention it a few more times. It comes originally from Aristotle. The idea is that if two people are in a similar situation, you should treat them similarly. If two people um, commit the same crime, they should get the same punishment regardless of the color of their skin. To decide what counts as just in any given context, though, you need to decide what counts as similar. So um, that takes us to what in, in Aristotle is thought of as justice in context. So like I said, I was getting these distinctions from Aristotle, and um, we can divide them up this way. Justice in the abstract is just being consistent, treating similar cases similarly. However, justice in context requires us to articulate what counts as similar. So um, for Aristotle, it would be obvious that a crime should be treated differently if it was treated, committed by a slave or by a citizen. That point is no longer a part of law and acknowledged ethics, even though maybe there's a fair amount of hypocrisy in the law these days. That's, there's still the idea that that kind of status is not relevantly similar, social status. So you need to articulate what counts as similar. 
Um, within the idea of justice in context, you have two important distinctions. Uh, you have two, you have an important distinction between two items. One idea is rectifying justice. This is justice in situations where things have gone wrong. So most people's association with the term justice is with criminal justice, right? The justice system in America is all about um, finding and punishing people who have broken the law. So all of these things are about what happens in society when something has gone wrong outside of the normal workings of society. Another branch of justice is called distributive justice. And this goes back to Aristotle as well. This is justice in the ordinary workings of society. So every society is a cooperative effort. We're all working together to grow crops and harvest energy from uh, you know, wood and gas and, and the sun. We, we work together to do these things. There's a certain amount of work that's done and a certain amount of benefit, right? Um, and so the question of distributive justice is the question of who gets the work and who gets the benefit. All right. Um, in this case, that, ha that applies to uh, medical research. Medical research is work, right? Um, being a, a medical subject is a burden in, in many ways. You have to put your health and life at risk. So your, a burden has been given to you. Now, where is the benefit going? I mean, so the distribution of burdens and benefits in medicine is going to be crucial for a lot of what we're talking about going forward. And I want to emphasize that, uh, that justice is another place where the, um, the case of Henrietta Lacks is manifestly immoral. Uh, that is, the burdens and benefits of this research were not evenly distributed. Um, families like the Lacks family got the burdens but as they point out themselves, they never saw, saw the benefits. They can't afford to see no doctor. And in general, right, the Jim Crow era that we start out the story in is manifestly racially unjust, um, and that extends to the practice of medicine. Okay, so that wraps up uh, the section on the Belmont Report. The next thing I want to do is take a look at another bit from Henrietta Lacks. So we're going to take a look at the medical establishment of her time and we're going to read another um, chapter or two.